and we are here, we are here sitting ducks. All we can do is try to be positive, but at least eating healthy vegan food. Let's be optimistic. But even when we have healthy vegan foods, we sometimes are missing certain nutrients. And there is one nutrient that I want to speak about today, which is called sulfur. It is not frequently discussed in nutritional circles, because sulfur was never much of a problem in terms of deficiency. But today, things have changed. Today, because we live in a highly polluted environment, because many toxins enter our body that never were around us previously, because we are exposed today to heavy metals of different types and in huge quantities, to the point that if we do an umbilical cord check on a baby, you find the entire constellation of heavy metals. Today, when I test people for heavy metals in their tissues, I find that 99% of the adults in this country are poisoned by heavy metals that accumulate in their tissues. 99%, even children. Some of them have bizarre heavy metals like thallium. Have you heard of thallium? But something like thallium, which causes nervous system diseases and fatigue and metabolic disorders, is in so many Americans today because they simply drive their car into their garage and allow themselves to inhale the exhaust when they get out of their car. Or at the gas pump, they smell the fume. Or they go to see a show called a, what do you call that show? In, hmm? Monster No, no, what do you call that show? Monster Truck Show, yes, but <laughs> I'm glad you know. <laughs> what is the show that happens on the 4th of July? Yeah. Firework. Firework. Yes, so you, when you have firework show next to you, and you inhale that stuff, that contains thallium. A lot of people today are exposed. There are many other toxins, and we need a mechanism to eliminate them from our body. That mechanism, that is what saves us from dying prematurely from mercury, arsenic, cadmium, aluminum, and other heavy metals, is called sulfur. And because of that, sulfur has become extremely important in recent years. Sulfation is a part of our detoxification process in the liver. Sulfation used to be not so important as a pathway in the liver, but today, sulfation has risen to number one. It's the highest important importance detoxification pathway because of the poisoning that occurs in our environment. And we don't get enough of it anymore in our diet. It's difficult to get sulfur. Where do you get sulfur in your food? Eggs if you eat eggs. But don't forget all the crucifers. Broccoli, cauliflower, kohlrabi, kale, all those crucifers that are known to be very healthy, also contain high amounts of sulfur. How many of us are eating enough crucifers on a regular basis? Every day. Every day you must have a big portion of crucifers. Also, all the, the family of onions and garlics, shallots, they all are fairly rich in sulfur and that's why they have that special smell. These are the main sources of sulfur in the diet. Unfortunately, today it is not enough. Even if you eat a lot of them, you're likely to be deficient in sulfur. That is one reason people have all kinds of problems. Why do you think MSM has become such a popular supplement? Because people are deficient in sulfur. So they easily develop cartilage problems, joint degeneration. And they go for MSM, which helps them. But MSM is fairly expensive as a supplement. And there are so many other supplements people want to take, like B12, like vitamin D. 
people want to take antioxidants, vitamin C. If they're sick, they want to take zinc. They want to take something to support the immune system. People now have a lot of supplements in their cabinet. Raise your hand if you have more than five types of supplements in your kitchen cabinet. Most people. Raise your hand if you have more than seven. Still most people. Raise your hand if you have more than 10. Still quite a lot of people. <laughs> so what does that mean? Why do we have so many? And is there a limit to how many supplements we can take? It's not in our food. It's not in our food. But is there a limit? I mean, are we going to take supplements more than we can eat? We, we still have to eat food first. Supplements are on top of that. So everybody has a limit. If you get to 10 supplements, in all likelihood, you will not want to take number 11 every day. You're going to say, enough. I cannot swallow more than these 10 types of supplements. We all have that psychological limit. For some of us, it will be just three. For some, it will be five. Because of all those doctors who prescribe those supplements, we ended up getting used to having even 10 or 15 in some cases. Not always justified, by the way. But if we have a mechanism of reducing the number of supplements by replacing them with a food that is truly rich in the nutrients that are missing, then we will not need 10 supplements. Maybe we can go back to nine. And when we have that special need, when we suddenly have severe problem, headaches, pain, fatigue, we can take number 10 to meet that, those type of conditions instead of saying, I'm, I give up. For that, we need to find those foods that will give us the highest nutrient density of the nutrients that are missing. And sulfur is missing. Sulfur in your body is as common as potassium. Everybody knows how important potassium is for cardiovascular health, but you have just as much sulfur. Both of them are number seven and number eight in their prevalence in the human body. Very, very common. And if we don't have enough, we cannot replenish the two grams per kilogram of our weight. So an average man who weighs 70 kilograms has 140 grams of sulfur within his body. That's a huge quantity for, for an element, for a mineral. It's like taking a big stick, two sticks of margarine or two sticks of butter, and that is the weight of all the sulfur that is in the body. That's a large quantity. Where is it? located in your body. Where do we have the most of that sulfur? In your hair, in your nails, in your skin. That's where when we burn your hair, it smells weird, doesn't it? It has a smell of sulfur. What else burns the same kind of smell? Bones? I don't know. I've never burnt bones before. OK. Um, I, by the way, I've never eaten flesh in my entire life. So I don't even know what flesh tastes like. Thank you. And now I will know. It tastes like gunpowder. Uh, flesh or just burning bones? <coughs> Where else do you have sulfur in your body? In your liver. Because your liver needs sulfur to detoxify. Where else do you have sulfur? In every proteinaceous chain in your body, in every protein, in every polypeptide, and in every enzyme that contains those amino acids that have sulfur in them. Methionine and cysteine are the two main classical amino acids that have sulfur inside them. Cysteine is usually missing. We don't have enough because today we are so toxic, we continuously have to manufacture glutathione. Glutathione requires three amino acids, glutamine, glycine, and cysteine. 
since our diet is very rich with the first two, we are always lacking in enough of the cysteine to create glutathione, which is the most important antioxidant inside our cells and the most important detoxifying agent inside our cells. We must manufacture a large amount of glutathione, and it depends on cysteine, which is a sulfur-bearing amino acid. It is so easy to be deficient in that, and that's why many people are taking a supplement called N-acetylcysteine, a cysteine derivative that brings us into the ability to manufacture glutathione. Without glutathione, we cannot survive as healthy people, as healthy adults. That depends on sulfur. Why are eggs so rich in sulfur? Yes? Exactly. It's for the feathers. Feathers are just like hair. Feathers to the chicken and the chicks is hair to humans. And when you burn feathers, they also smell very similar to burning hair. Because the little chick, the embryo that grows inside the little egg, is supposed to have all those feathers, there's a lot of sulfur in eggs. However, eggs also contain a lot of methionine. And when you have too much methionine, you have too much homocysteine. So too much methionine is toxic. That's why in many scientific studies, they have proven that when you give people too much, or animals, too much methionine, they die prematurely. And they have sickness and illness that people or animals on methionine-sparing diet would live much longer. So we need methionine as an essential amino acid, but we don't want too much of it. Eggs give you way, way too much methionine. Not only that, eggs contain a lot of another element called biotin, which is a vitamin. Biotin is also known as vitamin B7, also known as vitamin H. That's the vitamin of hair and skin and nails. That's also a vitamin that's important for our development and growth, crucial for our nervous system. People today could be deficient in biotin for various reasons. Biotin contains sulfur as well. It's an important one. However, if you eat eggs in their natural state, even though they are rich with biotin, when you eat the whole egg as nature intended, meaning without cooking it, you cannot absorb any biotin. Because there's a protein in the egg white called avidin, which binds biotin, and you cannot absorb any of it. That's why when you try to study the effects of biotin deficiency, what do you do? I don't do those studies, by the way, because I spare the lives of those poor rats. But I read some of the studies. When you want to prove what are the symptoms of biotin deficiency, you simply give the rats white, the whites of the egg, uncooked and then they all become biotin deficient, almost instantly, because they can't absorb any biotin. It's all bound by this avidin protein from the egg white. So obviously eggs were not something we ate much of in nature, because in nature we could not cook for hundreds of thousands of years. We only learned to cook more recently. That means if the food cannot be eaten in its natural state without causing us a deficiency, we might not want to eat it. Definitely not much of it. And if it contains methionine in large amount, we are at risk of shortening our lifespan and causing disorders associated with methionine metabolism, especially homocysteine goes up. One reason we don't want uh, to eat animal food, animal sources of food, is that they increase our homocysteine level. That's one of the toxic effects of eating meat and other animal products. And, of course, eggs. 
We don't want that much methionine. Where do we get methionine in, in a smaller amount that is healthy? In nuts, in seeds, and in grains. Very little in legumes. Mostly nuts, seeds, and grains. You don't need that much. If you have too much, you get toxic on it. But you still need the sulfur. Since methionine is the biggest source of sulfur in our body, and we don't want too much of it, because it can be toxic, we have to get our sulfur somewhere else. We can get it from our crucifers. We can get it from the onions and garlic. But it's not always enough. Because the foods today are hybridized and because a big amount of our caloric intake today comes from food that are poor in sulfur. We like to fill up our belly with beans and with lots and lots of vegetables. They are the majority of our diet and fruits too. But they are not very rich in sulfur. And then the little bit of crucifer that we eat, the broccoli, the cauliflower, the Brussels sprouts, etc., the cabbage, we don't eat enough of them. And some people don't like them because they think it interferes with their thyroid metabolism or because they don't like the taste of the sulfury, the sulfuriness of these crucifers. And the same is true for garlic and onion. Some people just don't want to be antisocial and eat too much of these garlics and onions, especially in their raw state, which is how nature intended for us to eat them in the first place. We would eat all those garlics and onions and we would lose some of our friends. So people don't want to have too much. And as a result, we hardly have the capacity of, co of uh, compensating for the insufficient sulfur in our food. Today, we have a new solution for this problem, a solution that helps us detoxify more efficiently using the sulfur, which is a part of all these enzymes containing that sulfur arm called the sulfhydryl arm that allows enzymes to bind heavy metals and take them out. Sulfur that helps the proteins in our body called metallothionins, which bind heavy metals and prevent them from damaging our cells. Sulfur in biotin and in um, thiamine, a B vitamin that contains sulfur as well. And the sulfur in cysteine, taurine, methionine that are amino acids and amino acid derivatives. And cysteine, of course, that contain sulfur. We need more and more of that sulfur so that our body knows what it, can, what it should do and build more and more of those sulfhydryl arms on our own enzymes. Because if we don't have enough sulfur, the enzymes will be manufactured and the sulfur will be missing. Without that sulfur, we cannot detoxify effectively. Sulfation stops. And sulfation is the most important pathway, as we said earlier, of detoxification. So today, we can get that sulfur without the methionine, without the foods that we might not want to have in huge quantities. Today, we can get the sulfur together with some minerals like potassium and trace elements without being toxic, without heavy metals. For that today, we have a new form of salt, new to the West. Salt that we can eat on a daily basis. How much salt did you eat today in this meal? It was delicious, wasn't it? It was delicious because there was salt in it. And we love salt. Now some people, some nutritional authorities tell you to avoid salt. You know who I'm talking about? I don't want to start a big argument about salt. I just want to go to nature and let nature decide for us. Are you in agreement with that? Let us not have man-made ideas or opinions. Let's look to what nature tells us about salt. And then you'll make your own decision. And the decision will therefore not be just related to the taste buds that make you want to eat salt. The delicious food we had today had a good amount of salt in it. 
That's why you enjoyed it so much. But in nature, we would have enjoyed it no less. In nature, we would have eaten a lot of seaweed every day. In nature, we would have lived close to the seashores of the salty oceans. That's the easiest path, way, way to walk and pass through distances. Not inside the jungle. Have you tried to walk inside the jungle? Come with me to Nepal. I'll have you check it out. After five minutes, you'll give up. It's next to impossible to go through the real jungle. So humans, for many thousands of generations, lived right next to the seashore. That's where you can easily walk. There, there are no jungles there. And that's where you can eat a lot of seaweed that are continuously washing over the, the sand. And they are so salty. And we have developed special mechanism to handle that salt. First, we have salty tears. Second, we have very salty sweat. Third, most of that salt is utilized in our adrenal glands. And we have special hormones that help us keep the salt in a healthy level as we urinate, or as we use the salt up for our different physiological functions. All of our cells require sodium chloride for interaction, for passing signals in and out of the cell. So if somebody tells me not to eat salt, when I'm sweating salt and crying salt, I have to be suspicious. I have to look at nature and say, why are they saying that? And if I look at elephants, and I look at other animals in nature that have a similar situation, they all are looking for salt. Elephants, close to my place in Thailand, are going into the lowlands and standing on one foot, having their entire body's weight on one foot. That's four tons on one foot, so that it would sink into the earth and then heavy sulfury liquid percolates upward so that they can drink it straight from the hole. They love the salt. Other animals are going and licking rock salt. Why are we so different? Only because some people told us that salt is bad for us? And then we drink so much water, and we dilute the salt in our, in our blood, and we end up with poor electrolyte balance in the, in the circulation, and we end up fatigued too easily, and we end up unable to handle stress because our adrenal glands suffer. We need the salt. We don't want the table salt that is highly refined. We don't want something white that contains nothing but sodium chloride, but we do want a natural source of salt that contains a whole array of trace elements as it occurs in nature. So we are going to the ocean and we are dehydrating the water of the ocean to get some salt. And you buy all those pink salts from here and black salt from Hawaii and you get Celtic salt from the ocean and you get pink salt from the Adriatic Sea. And you are being told, since you are Americans, nobody expects you to know geography very much. So they're telling you, this is salt from the Adriatic Sea that is so pristine. And you believe it, because you're good consumers. <laughs> and it has on it a, world, a word that holistic or natural. And immediately we resonate with that and we buy it. But do you know where the Adriatic Sea is? Have you heard of the Mediterranean? And all the sewer that goes into it from all those countries surrounding the Mediterranean bases? Many of them are not very developing countries. Many of them have no sewer control. All the sewer is pumping in huge quantities through the Nile River, the Dano, Italy, Spain, Greece, all the previous, the proud Balkan countries, what used to be Yugoslavia, Libya, Algeria, Morocco, Tunisia, Lebanon, Turkey, and the Black Sea with all the toxins of Europe coming in from the Danube, the Danube, the blue Danube, that is not so blue anymore. All those toxins are now 
in the Mediterranean Sea. I grew up on the Mediterranean Sea swimming next to the sewer pump that came out right next to me. Right? But it was considered safe. You don't notice it, right, as a child. Sometimes you wonder why you have those weird bacterial infection on your skin. I remember those too. I will not eat any salt that comes from that environment because it will have many pollutants in it. And the oceans today are so polluted that even if you dehydrate natural sea salt, natural, natural ocean salt, it is highly polluted. It's next to impossible without costing an arm and a leg to make a separation between the heavy metals, the pollutants, and the natural salt and the natural minerals that are useful to our physiology. That's why people are now looking for the Himalayan salt. We are flocking to the Himalayas. Why? Because the Himalayas represent salt rock that has been formed 300 million years ago under the Tethys Sea, the ancient ocean that surrounded Pangaea, the agglomeration of all of today's continents. And all that has accumulated layer by layer under that ancient ocean that only 65 million years ago when two continents collided, caused the rise of the Himalaya. So what has formed hundreds of millions of years ago, when everything was pure and unpolluted, all that has finally come above the ocean so we can mine it. That's why everybody is going for the pink Himalayan salt, because they know it's clean. It's from the Himalaya. We also have now the sulfur-rich Himalayan salt, which is completely different from the pink salt. The pink salt has no sulfur whatsoever. The black salt that comes from the Himalaya that tastes like eggs because it is so rich in sulfur comes from these rocks. This is the black salt from the Himalaya. You can lick that and it tastes like eggs right here in, in your hand. You can pulverize with a little hammer or with mortar and pestle. Very easy. Sometimes I put it in my mouth just to suck on it. If you have a soreness or inflammation or um, a canker sore inside your mouth, put it right next to it. It will heal really fast with the sulfur and the salt. It tastes good. It's just a little piece of it in the mouth. But when you make salt out of it, it becomes pinkish grayish like this. That's what it looks like when you completely pulverize it. In Nepal and in northern India and in Pakistan, this is considered extremely, extremely important. It's precious. Every family has this in their medicine cabinet because they can only afford to use it as medicine. Every time they have digestive issues, every time they have the flu or other conditions or sores, they use the black salt as their medicine because it costs three times as much as the typical Himalayan pink salt. We have now the opportunity to have it ourselves every day as regular salt because for us it's not so expensive. We can simply enjoy the salt every day because we need salt anyway. But we also need sulfur. Why not use our own salt to be also our source of sulfur. It's very simple. We started by talking about the children. This is about the children. I built this factory in Kathmandu, especially to support the children of Nepal. All the profits from this go to support the children in our schools and orphanages, daycare ch center, child care centers, community care centers, an elderly care center, which we're now starting to build as well, so that the children and the elderly can take care of each other. This is what's going to support all that, because it is very, very costly. This is the salt that I eat every day, because I want my sulfur, that I wouldn't be able to get in sufficient quantities otherwise. <coughs> sulfur is a nutrient. Salt is a food. 
salt has always been around us in nature and we always used it in nature. If you are not eating salt, you are going to get deficient in certain electrolytes and you will end up fatigued and sometimes dizzy and you will not know what's causing it until you get tested. If you go on long fast, if you go on water fast or juice fast, you sometimes end up deficient in some salt. I always recommend for people to add salt to their diet to be healthier. Even my own family, my own uncle, who used to dislike salt because he was afraid of hypertension, he avoided salt completely for a long time until he started having some heart problems and circulatory problems. I put him on salt. My aunt tricked him and added salt every day a little bit more and more so he will not notice it. Just a slight increase every day. And his problem disappeared. I've seen it with many other patients as well who need to have salt. I'm so happy now that we have a salt that tastes like eggs, that makes a sandwich taste like egg sandwich, that makes a salad taste like egg salad, that makes an avocado with black salt taste exactly like an egg salad. And Gillian has an idea just taking the white of the young coconut and making a paste out of it and adding some turmeric to make it yellowish <laughs> and adding the black salt and it is uncanny resemblance to having eggs without having eggs. Something that vegans might welcome unless they have had no eggs for so many years by now that they would be disgusted just by the idea of it. Just like I am totally disgusted by the idea of even sniffing animal flesh or putting it into my body because I've never had it. So it, for me, it's not food. Some people don't like eggs. Very few. If you don't like it, <laughs> if you don't like it, you can simply cook it. Cooking eliminates the hydrogen sulfide that gives it that special aroma and then it stops tasting like an egg, it becomes like regular salt. But it is still rich with sulfur, so you still get the benefit. So it's good for cooking, and it's good for eating raw. When it is raw, it will taste like eggs. I hope that you enjoy it, and if you don't, just cook it first, and then it will not cause that, that flavor. That's the black salt of the Himalayas, and the wonderful thing about it is it also supports this amazing project in Nepal that perhaps can change the way our children are being treated in the future, just like the children in Nepal are enjoying right now the care and affection that they deserve, that I hope we can one day extend not just to 3,000 children, but to 100,000 and even more so that we can stop this horrible transport of children, a kinder transport, so to speak. Children that are transported from age 5 to age 10 at the rate of 15,000 every year, taken from Nepal and sold in India for prostitution, slavery, and lifelong servitude. That should be stopped. That's a tragedy that can only be imagined if you compare the size of Nepal to the size of the United States. You would have to literally sell more than half a million American children every year to become slaves and prostitutes in Mexico. Every year, more than half a million children. Can you imagine something like that? That's what Nepal is going through. They're losing the next generation. And we can stop it. And while we stop it, we can nurture them, educate them, give them a sense of purpose, responsibility, and leadership, so they will become healthy community leaders in the future. And they will come to the United States to study for their PhDs. <laughs> they will come here to appreciate what we have done for them, to appreciate that we have given them the opportunity and that we did not look the other way when they looked us in the eyes and said, you can help me. 
you can just spend a hundred dollars a year and a child has full year of education and support and nurturing there is no reason not to make it possible it is so easy for us to become philanthropists the win-win situation here with assault is that not only we are philanthropists because we support the children we also enjoy the sulfur we enjoy the taste we support people who work in Nepal and that salt is clean. When I tested salt that came from India and Pakistan of the same variety, because of how they manufacture it, how they pulverize the rock, how they separate it from the actual rock of the Himalaya, it's done through toxic mechanism or chemical mechanism or extreme heat or with lack of hygiene or the machines are used for other food or other purposes. And that's why I found heavy metals in high amounts in the other forms of black sulfur-rich salt. When I tested ours, it had no heavy metals. It is clean. Five to seven thousand parts per million of sulfur, more than any food on earth, and it does not have toxic residues that you find in the salts that come from India and Pakistan, where maybe they even have slaves from Nepal working in those sweatshops to make salt that comes here very cheap and we don't even know how it was made. It's nice to know that it's coming from Nepal with a dedicated equipment where there is no leaded paint on the machinery, where the machinery is entirely used just for that purpose and that the factory is approved by the Nepali government, certified to export salt. And also we now have the papers from the FDA to import it to the United States. 100% of the Nepali profit go to support the children of Nepal. And it supports your health at the same time.